Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Jeremiah Ellison, and I'm, I'm the chair of the Policy and Government Oversight Committee. Uh, I'm going to call to order our regular meeting for Tuesday, March 6, uh, 2023. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Vital. Present. Councilmember Chavez. Present. Councilmember Koski. Present. Councilmember Johnson. Present. Vice Chair Wansley. Present. Chair Allison. Here. We have six present. Uh, let the record reflect that we have a quorum. We have 19 items on the consent agenda, which I'll uh, now read for the record. One is the appointed position in the police department, assistant uh, police chief. And two is appointed position in the police department, civilian police chief of staff. Three is passage of a resolution for a gift acceptance from the National Association of County and City Health Officials uh, of Travel and Lodging Expenses. Four is passage of a resolution for a gift acceptance from uh, Amplio Economic Development Corporation for Travel and Lodging Expenses. Five is passage of a resolution for a gift acceptance uh, from Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center for Travel, Lodging, and Meals. Six is passage of resolution establishing the 2023 Local Board of Appeals and Equalization. Seven is amending the 2023 General Appropriation Resolution, decreasing the racial equity, inclusion, and belonging appropriation, increasing the Office of Public Service Appropriation. Uh, eight is accepting a bid for Ramp A escalator removal. Nine is accepting a bid for refuse packer bodies and tipper assemblies. 10 is accepting a bid for the Upper Harbor Terminal, Lower Dowling Avenue, 33rd Avenue, and West River Road construction project. Uh, 11 is authorizing contract with Short Elliott Hendrickson Inc. for engineering and design services for Nicolet Avenue street reconstruction and bridge reconstruction. 12 is authorizing a contract with restorative justice community action for restorative justice services. 13 is authorizing a contract amendment with Tetra Tech Inc. for National Incident Management System Reset Exercises. 14 is authorizing a contract amendment with Urban Design Perspectives for continuing work for on the Climate Equity Plan. And five is authorizing contract amendment uh, with uh, Stan Tech Inc. for engineering and design services for the Upper Harbor Terminal Project. 16 is authorizing contract amendment with uh, Deloitte Consulting LLP for additional compensation consulting services. Uh, and 17 is contract amendments with organizations providing services under the Minneapolis Strategic Outreach Initiative. Uh, while this item was originally, uh, originally had three contract amendments at the request from staff, I'll be, removing, I'll be moving to delete the first contract um, amendment with the Corporate Neighborhood Organ uh, Association, Neighborhood Organization. 18 is authorizing contract amendments with various artists for the John Biggers Seed Public Art Project. And 19 is authorizing a contract with the uh, National Forum for Black Public Administrators for a recruitment table. Uh, is there any discussion on uh, the consent agenda? Um, Councilmember Watson. Thank you, Chair Ellison. Um, I just want to pull item 18, the contract amendment with various artists for the John Bigger C Public Art Project. Thank you. Um, and then I will pull items uh, one, two, and seven. Uh, item seven is being pulled uh, so that we can amend uh, the language per uh, staff's request. Um, and, uh, and then I'll talk a bit about uh, items one and two, um, uh, as those have been held from the past committee as well. So, uh, Seeing no further discussion, I'll move to approve items uh, three through six, eight through 16, 17B and 17C, and items, uh, item 19, uh, and I'll move to delete item 17A from the agenda. Um, a little bit convoluted, but all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. All right, uh, that motion carries and the consent agenda is approved. Um, I'll start with items one and two. Uh, these, are, these items were held, our staff positions, appointed positions in the police department. Uh, we uh, requested a presentation that will be coming tomorrow at Cal. Uh, and so we will be, uh, I'll be holding those items 
uh, in committee uh, uh, and taking no action today. Uh, but I think that uh, uh, after the presentation, if things go well, and I, I suspect that they will, or I hope that they will, uh, but as the public gets to see what the plan is, uh, what the vision is moving forward on these positions, uh, we'll have an opportunity uh, to pull the items of, at full council uh, either way, but I think as a part of transparency and due diligence, uh, it felt most appropriate to not take action until after we've seen the presentation. Um, uh, and then, do I have to make a motion to delay, to delay the items? Okay, we just, no action on those items today. Um, second item that we've pulled is item seven. Uh, so, I've pulled item seven uh, to amend it as requested by staff. Uh, this appropriation uh, amendment relates to funding for the annual Black Business Week event. The funding was originally to be transferred to the Office of Public Service, uh, but staff have since reached out to request that the transfer be to the Community Planning and Economic Development uh, Department due to their small business uh, program uh, being in better alignment with this event. Uh, and as such, I'll be moving to amend uh, the resolution to increase the Community Planning and Economic Development General Fund budget instead of the Office of Public Service. Is there any discussion on that item? Um, seeing no discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. And, and that motion carries. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and then on... Uh, Item 18 uh, is an amendment with various uh, public artists. Uh, let's see, we have Mary. I don't know if we have too many questions, but it, just in case, it's glad to have you here. Um, I pulled this item because uh, I think that I might be uh, one of the artists included on the item, and for that reason, I have to abstain from this uh, uh, from this vote. Um, I was an artist long before I was in uh, on the council on this item. Um, is there anything that you wanted to add, Solomon? All right, great. Uh, and I will call on Council Member Vice Chair Wansley. Thank you, Chair Ellison. With that said, I would like to motion for a separate roll call vote on this item. Council Member Vitale? Aye. Chavez? Aye. Koski? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Wansley? Aye. Allison? Abstain. We have five ayes and one abstention. And that motion uh, carries. Um, and uh, so our, our next item is an update related to the uh, <coughs> city's hate crimes response. Uh, and I understand that there's a presentation and so I'll now invite Civil Rights Director Alberta Gillespie to uh, get us started with the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Ellison and council members. Uh, I'm here to provide an update on the work in response to a council directive which asks uh, multiple city departments to consider and address the following. The city's existing protocols and policies for responding to hate crimes, particularly those targeted at places of worship, protocols and policies from jurisdictions that have been successful in deterring and accountability and healing from hate crimes, existing requests and recommendations from organizations representing, representing communities targeted by hate crimes. It also directed the staff to use this research to present possible best practices for preventing and responding to hate crimes, and again, particularly those targeting places of worship. What we'd like to do today is just give an update on how we are moving forward this directive. Um, we've been working in a very collaborative way, the Civil Rights Department, the City Attorney's Office, Minneapolis Police Department, and NCR. And so this um, presentation will focus on the tools we've identified that already exist in, in the enterprise to address hate and bias crimes, as well as um, our plan moving forward. So I will bring that up next, the city attorney's office. Thank you. Chair Ellison, members of the committee, I'm Mary Ellen Hang. I'm the criminal deputy. Um, I'm just going to give you a kind of a quick overview of what the law is. I think as we started these discussions, um, we thought that was a really good place to start so you know what already exists in state law. Um, and uh, then I'm gonna turn it over to two of my colleagues and our victim witness uh, specialist, and they're gonna talk about this a little bit from the victim perspective. So under the law, a biased crime is a crime that was committed because a person or a group of people's race, religion, sex, sexual orientation, national origin, or even their disability. 
The three main crimes that can be enhanced to a bias or hate crime are assault, damage to property, and harassment. Um, it can become a gross misdemeanor offense. And we're talking not an assault um, based on the level of injury. Um, the case that was in the news recently, um, that's a felony because of the level of injury on the victim who was transgender. Uh, while we believe that crime was motivated by bias, it is charged as, I believe, a third degree assault because of the injury. And that's where the law is kind of, I think, frankly, lacking. Um, because that crime is more serious because of the level of injury and not because of you know what the alleged uh, facts are. But an, an assault where there would not be a felony level injury can be enhanced to a gross misdemeanor, so up to a year in jail, um, if the victim or victims were assaulted because of their actual or perceived race, color, religion, all of those factors. Um, same with damage to property. Damage to property um, can be enhanced based on those factors, and then the same with harassment or violation of a restraining order. Um, I think some of the facts that we see in these kind of cases, um, some of them are obviously very, very obvious facts, right? If someone punches someone and uses a racial slur or other derogatory uh, remark, then that's going to be, could be elevated to a bias crime. Um, graffiti, depending on what that graffiti is, if it's on a place of worship or depending on, again, what they write can be. But it can be other things such as, you know, in the middle of the attack, if someone's cultural garments are pulled off, we might be able to enhance uh, based on that motivation or even something as simple, uh, not simple, but if they, as they're assaulting you or committing this crime, they say, go back to your own country. Those are the kind of facts that we look at that we can use in our analysis of should this be elevated to, um, to a bias crime. So now I'm gonna introduce two of my victim witness specialists, Julie Teets and Miriam Diaz. Uh, Ms. Diaz has been part of this work group. She's new to our office and was interested. The reason Ms. Teets is gonna present today is Ms. Diaz just got back from vacation and I didn't think I wanted on her <laughs> first afternoon back to ask her to appear. So she is here because she's part of it, but. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Julie to present um, just on some things from the victim's perspective. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Ellison and members of the committee. My name is Julie Teets and um, Miriam Diaz is my colleague, and we are victim witness specialists in the city attorney's office. And um, we just wanted to share some of um, the barriers that we, we can see as far as victims and involved in um, hate and bias crimes. So, you know, there's always the overall lack of knowledge um, inside and outside the system on what hate crimes are, what can actually be reported, where to go, um, you know, and that that is like the number one thing. And then also we see a lot of um, fear and shame from victims, um, you know, whether that's not being believed, fear of retaliation, um, the situation could get worse, um, those sorts of things, as well as language and bar um, cultural barriers, not knowing that, you know, if you don't speak, if your English is not your first language, that there are services available um, for translation, um, to talk, um, general mistrust of law enforcement and um, the legal system, not having knowledge of the U.S. system, you know, countries of, from um, countries of origin have different um, systems that don't match up, and so it's hard to sometimes navigate what um, is illegal in the U.S. versus what might be legal from um, your country of origin. Um, unaware of victims' rights and, um, you know, just overall training and lack of training in law enforcement and um, how to uh, work with victims um, of bias and what types of questions to ask to know, like, um, what the statute that could be applied to the statute and what um, um, could um, come from an interview on how to charge that out. Um, and then also just um, lack of resources. I mean, victims, when you're, if your case is in charge, you don't, you don't have um, many places to go. I mean, Miriam and I obviously work with lots of victims within the cities that um, the case has been prosecuted, but you know, not every case gets charged, and so there are um, barriers to that as well. So those were just our, our um, list that we have so far. It's definitely not a full list, um, 
and there is, um, that's all I have. Great, thank you. Hi, Chair Ellison, Council Members, thanks for having us today. My name is Kayla McCannandiera, and I'm the Director of the Complaint Investigations Division within the Civil Rights Department. And I'm here to talk a little bit about bias incidents that aren't necessarily criminal in nature, but can be addressed um, via the sub city's Civil Rights Ordinance and via the division um, that I lead, the Complaint Investigations Division. So what we're able to do, or what we're charged with under the ordinance to do, is to investigate uh, claims of discrimination. Um, we, where that usually comes up for us is um, and where we have jurisdiction to investigate is things like discrimination in employment, in housing, public accommodation, so where you might shop, use a gym, go to a restaurant, um, and in public services, so interactions with the police or with housing inspectors, other city employees, um, and in a few different areas. It's very similar to kind of the bias crime discussion um, that Mary Ellen was discussing where it has to be based on protected class. We do have a slightly more expanded list of protected classes in the Civil Rights Ordinance, so we the most often the cases that we see are, are similar. It's race, national origin, disability, sexual orientation, things of that nature, but we also have things like familial status um, and status with regards to public assistance within the Civil Rights Ordinance. And so what we kind of, how that works are just an idea of the types of situations that we would see bias incidents that we could investigate and have the jurisdiction to do so. It would be things like not getting a job or not getting a promotion and thinking that that's based on your protected class, race, national origin, disability, something like that. Um, it also could be experiencing a hostile housing environment or a house, hostile work environment based on your protected class, or it could be something like being denied services at a restaurant or a store because of your actual or perceived um, protected class. Just to give you a very basic overview of what our process looks like, if, if someone were to experience that and then come to our office with that, um, that experience in telling us about it. One, they can file a complaint lots of different ways, online, 311, they can come to our office. Um, and once we receive that complaint, my staff have interaction with them, get more information to understand what exactly occurred and whether it looks like it's something that fits under what we can enforce under our ordinance. Um, and then we proceed with helping them draft a charge of discrimination. So that charge is then, once it's drafted, is shared with the respondent, which is whoever is alleged to have engaged in discrimination, and then that entity, whether it be an employer, property owner, um, is able to respond. And then we're tasked with investigating whether it does, in fact, appear that discrimination occurred, whether there's enough evidence to, to demonstrate that that occurred, um, and then make a decision as to whether that is the case. Throughout that process and in an attempt to provide kind of more avenues for community to engage and have this be a productive process for them, we offer mediation. So we have a fairly new program that offers early mediation. So right after a charge of discrimination is filed, we bring folks in, it's, it's voluntary, but if folks are willing, um, we bring them in to meet with one of our uh, mediators. We have trained in-house mediators within my division. Um, and then they try to come to some sort of solution regarding what um, what happened. If that's not successful or say the parties don't want to um, participate in that, then we always have the ability to go through the full investigative process and make a decision as to um, what the evidence shows um, in regards to whether or not it occurred. If, for instance, we go through that whole process and yes, it does look like discrimination did in fact occur by an employer, property owner, whatever the, the case may be, we have what would be kind of considered a, a forced mediation, for lack of a better term, which we called conciliation. So that's where everyone's obligated to come in. And we talk to the person that filed the complaint and then the, the alleged discriminator and then the department as a part of that as well and try to reach a, a resolution, a settlement to the case. So in either that situation or in a situation where um, mediation occurred at some time along, along the way, the types of things that people get out of that, um, often it's monetary in nature, so a lot of times they get some sort of money um, paid out if they're settling a case, but also non-monetary things like being able to get a job back, stay employed, stay in their housing, or bigger picture items that hopefully will promote discrimination not happening in the future, like anti-discrimination tra training, policy changes, um, things like that. So that's kind of kind of what they're looking at um, that comes out of our process. I will highlight that we had a pretty successful year in 2022 with that, with over $500,000 collected on behalf of victims of discrimination throughout the year, either via conciliation or mediation kind of along the way. 
And then the last thing I'll highlight, um, and as I'm sure you all know, because you hear from your constituents as well, if we get complaints that are bias related incidents, but don't necessarily fall under our jurisdiction. So it's not an employer or a property owner. It's maybe just a member of the public on the street that they had an interaction with. Maybe it's a neighbor, um, something like that, which we don't have jurisdiction um, to necessarily investigate. But we have formed a partnership with Seward Longfellow Restorative Justice, and we do refer those cases there. Um, to either provide the person that experienced this more resources in their neighborhood, more ways to feel supported, um, or potentially a, a restorative conference if they're able to engage with the person that was allegedly in, engaged in the bias, the bias incident. So that's just some stuff from our um, department and division that we do that's you know somewhat related um, to the hate crime concern. And with that, I will turn it over to the Minneapolis Police Department folks that are here. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chair Ellison and other council members. Uh, I am Lieutenant Molly Fisher. I am in charge of the pre-service uh, training for MPD. And with me is uh, Lieutenant Kazri Nazampour, who is in charge of our procedural justice division. Uh, we are here on behalf of uh, Deputy Chief Waite, who could not be here uh, with us this morning. And she asked uh, for us to come and speak with you. Um, I just wanted to address uh, some of the policies that MPD uh, has in place. Uh, we do have a specific policy and procedure um, on responding to biased crimes uh, in our manual. Um, officers that respond to those calls, uh, whether they actually observe something that appears to be a biased crime or the victim is just alleging that there is a biased crime, um, our policy is that they shall uh, take a police report uh, for that uh, crime. Um, and that they shall actually call a supervisor to the scene as well, um, who shall also observe uh, anything that occurred there and that they shall as well uh, add a supplement to uh, that, um, that case report. And then as far as the training side of things, uh, within the uh, police academy, uh, we do actually discuss the biased crimes in our report writing uh, class where it is discussed uh, of them doing uh, that particular thing that we were, that I just explained. Uh, as well as uh, there are follow-up question uh, within our policy procedural testing process that we have throughout the academy as well. Uh, there is a question on uh, having to report uh, biased crimes, and we are actually discussing at the moment adding a reality-based training scenario uh, within our academy as well that would relate to a biased crime. Again, that's a discussion that has not actually, uh, that is not in process as of yet. And then as far as the, our procedural justice uh, side of things, um, obviously procedural justice is talking about the legitimacy of policing, um, our communication, uh, the way that we treat people, and obviously discussing that key piece we think is an important factor of um, allowing people within the community to feel comfortable uh, within being able to actually um, discuss these uh, incidents with us and actually report uh, these particular crimes. If you don't have any questions. That's all I have for you this morning. No questions so far. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Good to see you. Good afternoon, Chair Ellison and Council Members. My name is Karen Mo. I'm Director of Neighborhood and Community Relations, and we are also involved in this um, joint department project. Um, our role really is, I think as Julie and Miriam pointed out, is to talk about and remind ourselves of the barriers in community to accessing this information. Um, as well as accessing the resources that are available. So we'll continue to support this work. I think in addition to that, what we recognize is for some of our community members, reporting this is there are challenges within our communities. Either folks do not understand how to report it, meaning the language that we may use within government systems to acknowledge it, which we heard the de uh, police department acknowledge they're doing training within their department to help city staff understand how to better acknowledge it. But we also know that within some of our communities, there still is a lack of trust of reporting this or as been mentioned before, maybe even shame um, of reporting it. And so we will continue to bring that into the conversation to make sure that as this work brings information out to community members, we continue to do it in a way that assures the information is accessible, but as well as we recognize the dynamics within communities around how they talk about this issue. I think lastly, we would also um, bring in the concern about reducing this crime overall. So thinking about even upstream, not necessarily waiting until something happens, but what can we as a city do to actually send a message that we will not tolerate hate crimes 
um, and so we will continue working on this. I will say I appreciate uh, council members raising this issue and bringing this to a directive to city departments as well. I appreciate all of my colleagues and uh, Director Gillespie for continuing this work. We started this before the directive, I think, three or four years ago, and so to have the direction from council um, is extremely helpful in this. Thank you. Thank you. So um, hopefully uh, council member, I mean, Chair Ellison and council members, that gives you an, uh, an idea of what's currently happening in the city to address hate and bias crimes. And so our goal has been to take the directive that was given to us and figure out how we can collaborate to be proactive as uh, Director Mo just said. And so when I talked about before as a civil rights director, the education, elevation and engagement, bringing all of that to this particular directive. And so it's been, a, I, I will say it's really been a great um, effort on all of the departments that were represented here today and they are fully committed to addressing this issue and we understand the importance of it but oftentimes in the city we know that there's a lack of human resources and capacity to address these issues so in our meetings we determined that um, what I offered up as the Civil Rights Department is that we're in the process of hiring a project coordinator in a position that can do a, a citywide campaign about this particular issue and then also help us as uh, internal staff figure out where we can coordinate, where the, the, the um, opportunities for us to collaborate uh, in, in addressing this issue. So I'm really excited about that. We will start interviewing people actually this week for, for that position. So um, there is not a lack of commitment or, uh, or um, passion around this. And it is one of the primary things that when I came into this civil rights position and and um, Karen, uh, Director Mo talked about this, but even when I came into this position a little over a year ago, that staff brought to me in terms of this is what the community is feeling, places of worship, our AP, AAPI community, just a, a number of different areas, our immigrant community, where um, our transgender community, where this is being felt. We know that there has been an increase in hate crimes if you look at the FBI statistics on this. We had an opportunity to look at some of those. And so we know that these things are on the rise. So to have this um, campaign where we can educate and engage the public and work with the community on how we can proactively try and prevent, but when it does occur, how we then address that. That is how we plan on moving forward. With that, I will stand for questions. Well, first, I just want to say, uh, just give an incredible thank you to your team, to all the directors and departments that are part of this collaboration. You know, one of the things that, you know, uh, governments kind of in general get criticized for is working in silos. And so to see multiple uh, 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 departments coming up to present on the work that they're doing in relation to this, because uh, it's not just a civil rights issue. It has all these other layers that it touches. And uh, and so that's, uh, that's really encouraging to see. And so thank you for that. And I know we have a few questions from colleagues, and I think I have a few questions myself, but we'll start with uh, Vice Chair Wansley. Thank you, Chair Ellison, more so of a comment. Um, so thank you so much to our staff for this presentation. You know, I got unanimous support for this research in October after a mosque in War II was vandalized with a hate crime. Um, and sadly, this is also opportune timing for this presentation as uh, City Attorney Mary Ellen highlighted, you know, we had this tragic um, attack, horrific attack on um, a transgender relative uh, just this last week. So as you noted, we're seeing the rise in these attacks amongst um, many of our vulnerable communities and most vulnerable uh, constituents. So this is a incredibly tragic reminder that we need to be looking at our practices and taking action to make sure that hate crimes um, on the basis of race, religion, gender, or anything else, as you noted, is not happening in Minneapolis that we're setting that standard and that, that goal um, bar. Um, so again, just wanna thank uh, you know, civil rights for leading this work and for the city attorney's office and neighborhood community relations and the police department for being uh, a part of it. I will say I was disappointed and confused to not see um, our commissioner of the Office of Community Safety lead and being involved in this work. Um, I envisioned that this is exactly the kind of work that would be perfect for our new uh, OCS um, department because it is, as you all demonstrated, a multi-department response. It requires everyone to have their hands, um, you know, supporting this work. Um, but 
Nevertheless, again, I just want to thank civil rights for taking the lead and in, in convening um, many of our great departments to really troubleshoot how we can better respond and be proactive around this issue. Um, and I look forward to working with every single one of you to continue strengthening our response. But again, you know, making Minneapolis a model where we are proactively doing everything possible to make sure that this is not tolerated and not encouraged in our city. So thank you all. I wanted to, I don't know if there are any other questions from colleagues, but I, I wanted to uh, ask a clarifying question from my own knowledge of uh, uh, Attorney Mary Ellen. Uh, there was, uh, you talked about if the, if the assault was severe enough, it would get elevated, but then no longer be considered a hate crime. Is that, is that, did I misunderstand that? I just wanted to make sure I was. Chair Ellison, members of the committee. So um, the, for, for assaults, they, they get enhanced based on two, uh, two legal, legal issues. One, if someone has a certain number of prior convictions, mm -hmm. then, um, you know, assaults can be enhanced based on, you know, a second one in, you know, I think five years, 10 years, I, for, I don't have my book in front of me, but you know, they could be a gross misdemeanor, it could be a felony based on priors. Yeah. Um, for assaults, though, they can become felonies based on level of injury. Mm. Um, so, you know, if I, if I say were to, to punch you and break your orbital bone, the mm -hmm. fact that I broke a bone, that's going to be a felony level injury, mm -hmm. um, even if I have no prior history. Right. So in the incident that happened, uh, again, I'm not familiar enough uh, with the person's criminal history, but let's just, let's say that the person who who's alleged to have done the crime that just happened uh, yep. here, that person has no history based on what I understand just from what I've read in the news of the level of injury, that's going to elevate this to a felony charge. But we, but we know at least some assumptions are being made that this was also motivated by mm -hmm. the victim being transgender. That will come, you know, we'll see how that plays out in court. But, but if, um, but it's a felony charge and I haven't seen the complaint, but I'm assuming it's a, like a felony third degree yep. and then the bias charges may actually be lesser offenses because of the fact that this is a felony level. Whereas if if the victim was not as severely injured and you know had no demonstrable injury, it might be if they had no priors, normally a fifth degree of misdemeanor, but we could enhance that to the gross misdemeanor because of the, the motivation that caused that. Got it. Does that make more sense? That does make sense. That does make sense. Um, and, uh, and I just wanted to, you know, I, I think a part of when the public hears about the term hate crime, and I think when you know your average layperson hears the term hate crime, it's it sounds severe. It sounds like that, it, but it speaks to intent. And I know that. Uh, and so when I was hearing like things will get elevated based on injury, not necessarily uh, someone's intent. You know, it just kind of speaks to, you know, that we uh, that at least in the law, maybe the term hate crime doesn't necessarily carry the same weight that it that it does with us and that it maybe should. Uh, so I was, uh, so anyway. And, and Chair Ellison, members of the committee, I, I think that's a really great point. And I think it's something, um, you know, that should be discussed at the state level because there are certain things that add additional penalties to a crime. You know, if, if a certain crime is committed and a gun is used, right, mm -hmm. then there can be additional penalties. So this is one of those strange anomalies where you know, obviously assaulting someone is very serious. But then if you're motivated by one of these these factors, you would think that should elevate your penalty or something. But yet it may not be the most serious charge that you could face. Right. Um, and I think, you know, if if I had my way, that would be looked at. And perhaps there'd be some changes at the state law level to, to really make this as serious as it is. Because I think in this particular case, you know, it's... It's a more serious charge because of the unfortunate injuries and not necessarily because of what the motivation was. And that, that doesn't seem to really accurately reflect, reflect what happened to this, to this victim in this case. Right, right. Well, thank you so much. Um, are there any other questions from colleagues? I don't see any other questions. And I, I would just like to say, Chair Ellison, Council Member, publicly thank you to all of the departments here on, because it has honestly been just a, a pleasure to work with them and witness the passion around you know this particular issue and protecting and educating our um, constituents here in Minneapolis. So thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, seeing no further discussion, uh, I'll ask the clerks to file that report. Uh, and with that, we've concluded all business to come before the committee today. And if there's no objection, we are adjourned. Thank you all.
need to renew their business licenses annually. Look at your license certificate to find out when it expires. Or you can visit our website to view a list of renewal and expiration dates for all license types. Business licensing will mail out a renewal billing notice approximately 45 days before your renewal is due. Most licensees will only need to verify the information 